jeepers! You're listening to Smash or Pass. Hello everyone, welcome back to another interview on the JB and Millie channel. I'm JB and joining me is Sophie. Hey. And we have Tori. Hi. And the special guest who will be interviewing today is Miss Sarah Jane Sherman, who was recently the voice director on Trick or Treat Scooby-Doo. And of course, we're going to get into the entirety of your career at some point within this interview. But thank you so much for joining today. Thank you for having me. I was honored even to be asked. So thank you. Oh, that is absolutely incredible. I mean, just going through your filmography, it is almost like a trip for our childhood. And, you know, looking through the early years, I understand that you were a casting director on a few of the of the Disney programs. And so to that end, was being a casting director with the eventual goal of doing what you're doing now and getting into voice directing or did one kind of lead to the other by coincidence almost? Yeah, I would say it's probably the uh, latter that one kind of led to the other. I started out at Disney um, and that's where I learned the casting process, starting as a talent coordinator, which is kind of the entry level position as, uh, you know, doing casting, kind of arranging the talent, uh, scheduling talent and booking them and assigning them various roles. So that's kind of the first step into the casting process. And I got to learn the casting process at Disney Television Animation working my way up through the ranks. And I left there after about 12 years to uh, go work on a different project that didn't last too long. And um, once I kind of did that, I found myself in the freelance world and I was like, okay, uh, so I know how to do casting. Um, Let's see if we can expand things. And then I ended up doing voice directing and coaching and just kind of covering uh, voiceover as a whole, you know, kind of tried to tackle the the whole industry, I guess, as much as I could from, from my perspective. Yeah, that makes sense. Like having that variety of of things, and given how experienced you are at this point with different television shows and different types of performers, is there any particular television shows or performances from particular voice actors or voiceover artists that you remember before your career that may have had an impact about how you would eventually go on to cast and direct people yourself? That's an interesting question. I mean. As a, as a child, um, I was always someone that watched a lot of primetime television. You know, I'd watch from, you know, turn on the TV at 8 p.m. and watch until I was, my parents made me go to bed, hopefully 10 p.m. And then as I got older, 11 p.m. and just watch all of the shows. And I would always watch all of the credits. I mean, I don't remember having IMDb or anything like that back then, of course, but I would watch all the credits and kind of mentally keep track who was doing what role and really just started to learn all the actors. So, as I, you know, was starting to get started or starting my career in casting as a talent coordinator, I knew a lot of those actors and I could kind of bring them into animation because I just was familiar with all of those names. Because a lot of times it isn't necessarily the lead actor that we're looking at in live action, but it's studying kind of the the best friend, the neighbor that pops in, all of those great one-liners that really transition well into animation, into voice acting, because they kind of come in, say their funny line, and then <clears throat> and then leave. So it's kind of bringing those people into animation. So just TV, I'm a fan of TV as a whole. I majored in television and I studied it. I watched it. I mean, I know it's kind of a weird thing. My parents had a thing too. We're going to pay for you to study television. But yeah, that's what I did. And um, just became a student of television as a whole. Okay. Well, you kind of talked a little bit about your time as a talent coordinator, but is there anything else that you can share with us that was interesting about that job particularly? Yeah. Um, So when I first got started as a talent coordinator, the shows uh, I was assigned to were Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, a show called Yin Yang Yo. um, And then uh, one of my first earlier shows was Phineas and Ferb, doing the pilot of Phineas and Ferb. And so um, for Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, it's really interesting because you have these actors that, you know, have done these iconic characters for so long. And I'm, you know, booking Rusie Taylor and Wayne Allwine and Tress McNeil um, and uh, Bill Farmer, you know, to kind of do all these iconic roles. But then other roles would come up on the show and it's learning their range and saying, okay, they can also do this role and they could cover this role and really kind of learning how this core group of icons could do a lot of different roles um, and finding their range as we were doing, or as, as I was doing, I was learning their range. Um, and then 
with Yin Yang Yo, it was a show that took place in Canada. So kind of opened up to a bunch of Canadian talent that I'd never worked with and getting to learn that as well. Um, and then Phineas and Ferb uh, doing that pilot um, was very special to me because when I started at Disney, I actually started in development. That's what I came out to Los Angeles to do. I was going to be in development. And that means I would help develop new shows for television. I started out as a coordinator uh, in development as well. And Phineas and Ferb was one of the first shows I got to help develop. So then it moved along in the process and then it became time to cast. I had just switched into casting. So they let me help uh, coordinate and cast that show as well. So, um, you know, I've been on Phineas and Ferb for years and years and years and years kind of working on that show. Um, but that's kind of what stands out, I think, is my early time in, as a as a talent coordinator at Disney. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So now jumping forward, um, <laughs> you recently voice directed for the new Animaniac show. Um, is there any additional pressure from your end when working on a show that has kind of like a pre-established fandom? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, Animaniacs is so special to me. Um, but yeah, definitely had that pressure. Um, first off, you know, I'm coming in, filling, not even filling the shoes, I don't even want to say that, um, taking the reins from Andrea Romano, you know, I mean, she's the, the queen. And, you know, she had since retired. And so they had to bring in a new voice director. So kind of coming in after that, that's bananas, you know, I mean, that pressure is 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 very high. And then coming in to these actors have been doing these characters for 20 years or however many years. And even though there was a break in between the two shows, they were still on tour and doing these characters for fans and doing, um, you know, Rob uh, had his tour and he would bring other people along with him. And I was kind of coming in and I was thinking to myself, well, what am I going to say? Actually, the character doesn't sound like that. Or, hey, try it this way. Who am I off the street to then try to tell any of these um, legendary voice actors how to do these roles they've been doing for 20 years? So really, it was finding my place on the show and kind of where I could actually help. Like, what can I bring to that bring to the table? Um, not to mention, as you said, there's so many fans that love, love, love these characters and have very strong opinions about these characters and who we cast and how the lines are delivered. Um, and, uh, you know, bringing back any project is going to be compared to the original. So, yeah, I mean, I think there was a lot of pressure. Um, I And it was one of my first major, major voice directing credits. Um, so I had this very strong memory of our very first record where I had eight actors lined up in front of me. This was pre-COVID. So kind of lined up in a booth. I had uh, Warner Brothers executives. And then um, Steven Spielberg wasn't there, but his whole team from Amblin was kind of right behind them. Then we had the production. And then I had eight actors in front of me. And it was like, go, Sarah, lead this room. And I mean, I probably was visibly shaking at the time. Um, I, I accidentally, my big <laughs> mistake was I called uh, Wacko Yakko and I never forgave myself. I was like, oh my gosh, I mixed up Wacko and Yakko. I'm going to fail. I'm never going to succeed, you know, but uh, it ended up working out. They forgave me. Jess kindly said, oh, you mean Wacko? And I said, yes, I meant Wacko. I'm an idiot. <laughs> um, and then we carried on. But, uh, you know, now it's funny. But uh, at the time... <laughs> sweating you know just uh it was intense <laughs> um given your impressive resume and having been involved with so many iconic shows um to what extent does fun feedback get back to you and after the shows have come out um i think i mean i do see some of the fan feedback i'm on twitter i'm pretty active on twitter so i i see some of that specifically if i'm tagged in it and sometimes i'll read stuff as well um every once in a while people pop on and say things about the cast whether they think the show was cast well or they think someone else should have gotten the role and sometimes i see that um but yeah i do i do see some of the fan feedback just because like i said on twitter it'll say like what's trending and i'll say oh this show's trending let me see why and you know check it out um so it's hard because it's, you know, sometimes the negative stuff is the loudest. Um, so it's hard to 
take it all in of what's, you know, what's the general feeling, but you do your best work and you assume that hopefully someone's loving it or else that's why they keep getting more of the shows. Well, fan feedback aside, um, your amazing work has definitely received positive recognition, um, such as a recent Emmy. Um, um, how does it feel like to receive these types of accolades? Unreal, unreal and undeserved. I mean, I'm not as into watching the award shows as I was when I was younger, but I, again, it's like all from my childhood when I could picture watching these television shows and then watching these award shows and these glamorous people kind of coming up on stage and accepting these awards. And it's, it doesn't even make sense that I would also win an Emmy because I still consider myself that little kid watching television and every once in a while they let me, you know, assign a few roles and direct a few actors. Um, so that seems crazy. I mean, the weirdest thing is because I also won during a pandemic. So it was announced on Twitter and I didn't even see it until one of my friends texted me, hey, I think you just won an Emmy. And I was like, huh? You know, and it because it was um, the Emmy's supposed to be that night, but they announced some of the categories during the day, maybe they, you know, just to kind of help with the flow of the show. And I was like, wait, what? And so like, I'm literally in my PJs or something, you know, sweatpants. And I'm like, I just, I just won an Emmy. Like the biggest moment of my career. It's very funny. It's like, I was at home you know, in my pajamas, <laughs> but it's, it, it's, I mean, it's exciting. I mean, it definitely must be a very different experience, of course, during the pandemic, because I remember, like, being in the UK on, like, the UK time zone, a lot of the award shows when they were live streaming, if you really wanted to see them, you'd almost need to set an alarm for, like, one in the morning to, like, catch yeah. the live feed, and so I've got a lot of fond memories from just, like, chugging energy drinks, just trying to, like, beyond the ball of it so the fact that it was all announced on twitter for a while was such a uh, it's such a weird time and you yeah. know hopefully we're kind of getting to a stage where we're getting a bit more gravitas with events you know on the the guise of safety of course but i guess recently one of your recent credits and i guess the reason why we're speaking currently is because if it isn't obvious from the crazy backgrounds that we're dealing with, we are Scooby-Doo fanatics. And so when Trick or Treat Scooby-Doo came out, it was definitely a breath of fresh air, because I think, that obviously not to disparage, you know, some of the other works that came before that, but I think it's fair to say that Trick or Treat Scooby-Doo came out and was particularly, at least it resonated with me particularly. So based on the performances in that, how familiar were you with the franchise, I guess, before signing on to the movie? Yeah. Um, well, I definitely had watched it as a fan kind of growing up. Um, and I was very floored when they asked me to interview for that project. Um, but I was excited and happy to do it. I worked with a lot of the actors before, but never as those characters. And I got the call that I got the job. And so we kind of went in and we just, you know, knocked it out of, you know, just days and days and hours and hours and weeks and weeks of kind of getting these records done. Um, it actually went very quickly because these actors have been playing these roles forever. So, you know, I was very used to, I think I probably said at the interview, like similar to what I did at Animaniacs, these actors have been playing these characters forever. I mean, Frank Welker has been, you know, Fred since the very beginning. So who am I to say, hey, let's do it this way. Um, but, you know, kind of using Animaniacs as that example. But uh, it was incredible. And you know, with a lot of these Scooby-Doo franchises, there's a new team that does uh, each project. And even that very first day of the first record, hearing the actors do the iconic characters is always kind of, you know, you catch your breath for a second when they jump into it. And, you know, hearing Frank do, um, going back and forth between Fred and Scooby and just kind of going back and forth and having a conversation with himself um, is, is incredible. Um, so it was a it was a wonderful experience and a bit of a gateway experience because it got me in with that team. And then I ended up working on a couple other Scooby-Doo projects from then. Um, and so I, I've really gotten to know uh, that the, the these characters and, and this world even more. That's so interesting because it's so great, like having spoken to. I guess so many amazing people, including yourself, about the ins and outs of these projects. I'm curious to know, like, in terms of, like, you've mentioned how your work on Trick or Treat Scooby-Doo came about, but in terms of that initial interview process, I mean, is there anything that you need to prepare for for that type of situation? Or what is the prep work that goes into, I guess, almost auditioning for a movie? Yeah, exactly. I mean, so 
with these um, types of interviews, so there's two main things that I do aside from coaching. I do, I'm a casting director and I'm a voice director. So some shows I cast on, some shows I voice direct on, and then some shows I do both. So, um, and I interview differently depending on what they need. So with this type of show, I was just interviewing to be a voice director because the talented cast, at, uh, talented team at Warner Brothers was already casting it. The leads were already in place and they were just filling it in like with Coco Diablo and all the other um, side villains that kind of come back. And, um, you know, it's, the, the way I approach these kind of interviews, uh, like you said, an audition almost, is you want to be a friendly face in the room that allows creativity and allows people to try things and um, makes room for comedy. You know, if you kind of run a room in such a way that, um, okay, we're going to line number one. Great. Now line number two, you know, more of a drill sergeant. It doesn't really foster that creativity and the kind of flow. Like I try to make jokes and try to get laughs and keep the room really light. Because if you kind of harp on one line too long, or if, you know, tension, the room gets tense by any means, it squashes all the creativity and all the comedy. And you really want all of these characters to pop. So treating every character um, as if it's its own special role, because it is, and treating every actor with respect. And so kind of showing that um, personality, I think, in the interview process. Does that make sense? What I'm saying, kind of, you know, showing how you lead a room and chatting and keeping things light and fun. Yeah. So you mentioned that you were familiar with some of the actors before, but when signing on, was there a particular character or actor even that you were excited to work with? Yeah, I mean, um, so I had worked with Frank Welker in Animaniacs, and then Gray is on a, a ton of the shows that I have. But um, in Kate Micucci, we did uh, a couple of things like Milo Murphy's Law, and she played Sarah, uh, a couple of different things there. I hadn't worked with uh, Matthew Lillard before, so that was kind of my first time working with him. Um, so that was exciting to kind of see his transition into Shaggy. Um, but then, like I said, hearing Frank do... Scooby and, and Fred back to back was was very exciting for me. And just, um, again, that master class in voice acting of, oh, wait, OK, that's how you. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. How it just knocks that out. Just pages of dialogue just going back and forth as, you know, talking to himself. Um, so I think that I'd probably say seeing Frank in that role, I was very excited about. Yeah. So given that this Scooby-Doo was a feature length film, does it kind of change any of your process um, or work when compared to working on like a TV series? Yeah, that's a great question too. I mean, I think it's the arc of the character takes a little bit longer, you know, just to kind of, it's a little bit of a slower arc as opposed to TV. Maybe it, you know, happens quickly in an episode or it can happen over a whole season or over a whole series. So they're just different pacing. Um, I think of what we're trying to accomplish character wise, uh, just depends. Um, also probably giving a lot more breaks. I mean, as you recall, you've got them screaming ah, across, across the screen, ah, back across the other way, ah, running and screaming, scared of ghosts every other scene. So um, kind of saving that until the end because there is so much uh, high intensity that I don't want to blow out their voice. Um, if these actors, you know, in a, 11 minute or 22 minute episode, we might not be recording actors for a full four hours, but with this type of movie, we're recording them for multiple four hour sessions where they're talking the whole entire time. So just the pace also to which uh, we get it recorded, making sure we give more breaks and you know they have time to rest and recuperate their voice. When directing the cast of Scooby-Doo, was this the type of show where they recorded as a group or did they record separately? Because it was the pandemic, we recorded everyone separately. Um, also because I think because of the schedules and everything and because, you know, everyone had different scenes to kind of do together. But yeah, everyone recorded individually for it. Um, would have been awesome if they had done it as an ensemble. But as I recall, it was mid, like right at the start of the pandemic. So we could not have any of that. You mentioned Coco earlier, um, and a standout performer and character was Marina Valesco, who voiced her. When you involved her in the casting, um, or she already signed on um, when you started to work on the movie? Yeah, I um, hadn't done any um, cast. I didn't do any casting on this show, so uh, she kind of came in. We didn't know who Coco Diablo was going to be, and then Mirna came in, and she was fantastic. Um, 
and uh, you know, it was just a perfect fit for the role and really just embodied, Co embodied Coco Diablo uh, in her performance. So um, I'd known her before and had heard her auditions and I think worked with her in small roles here and there, but this was kind of the biggest role that I'd worked with her in and uh, she killed it. She was great. Yeah, definitely one of like my favorite new characters. And I guess there was a lot of ways that you could have gone about that character in particular. You know, of course, there may be some type of fear of making a bit of an Edna Mode type character, but definitely Coco managed to stand on her own as her own individual character. But in terms of getting to that stage from, I guess, what you do with um, Marina and then what we saw on, you know, the DVD do you kind of submit multiple versions like over or do you kind of have one vision that you almost pilot your way into? No, that's a great question too. Um, so typically, you know, if an actor has auditioned for the role, I hear their audition and that's what the creative team responded to and that's what they want us to go with. So I'll hear the audition, I'll ask, hey, is there anything we need to adjust for this? And they say, no, that's pretty much the character. If they are an offer only or have not auditioned for it, we spend the first couple minutes of the session trying to hone in the voice and hone in the character. But then as we're going along, a lot of times I'll make sure I get at least uh, or a minimum of three takes per line and I try to find that variation. My goal is that um, when they go into edit and kind of put everything together, they have lots of different versions of the line to play with. So um, I do try to find that variation in kind of a line-by-line -line setting uh, as opposed to for delivery and attitude and um, you know how they're going to say the line versus necessarily the vocal quality of the character or the um, presence of the character. Does that, does that make sense there? Yeah, I definitely can see that because I think the character of Coco, it's kind of bad to say, but I think she almost had an uphill battle to face, get, being such a remarkable character, but also kind of being our first gateway into a canonized, almost, you know, canonized LGBTQ representation in the world of Scooby, which we'd never had before. And so did that fact alone play on anyone's mind in terms of we have to nail this character or like, did it affect the behind the scenes at all? Yeah, I mean, I think we wanted to get it right, but we didn't want to make a meal of it, if that makes mm, sense. Yeah. You know, didn't want to like, you know, hit the nail over the head. Hey, everybody, guess what we're doing? Does everybody see what we're doing? I mean, that was, you know, not what we were trying to accomplish. Um, but just kind of letting it happen naturally. I think that was the, the key is to make it feel organic or authentic and didn't feel like it was forced in any particular way. I would say that would be kind of what we were focused on, our main goal. Mm -hmm. As JB mentioned, um, Scooby fans can be quite the critics, um, but this movie came out to a pretty great degree of success. Um, saw lots of positive comments everywhere. How does it feel to be a part of a movie that was actually beloved by fans? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was great. I mean, this is one of the, I think, first actual movies that I've done as a voice, or the first movie that I've done as a voice director. So that was really special and important to me. And then it was Scooby-Doo makes it, even more crazy. Um, you know, I, I could actually tell my parents, hey, I worked on a Scooby-Doo and they actually know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so that feels very special to me. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm thrilled. I think it, it, it feels great. I would say, you know, it feels great. Well, speaking about past successful projects, do you have any upcoming projects that you can share with us, please? Um, yeah, so, uh, I have a show on Netflix that's going to be airing next month, uh, starting called My Dad, the Bounty Hunter, which is going to be a really fun uh, space travel uh, television show that's going to be great. Um, I think we've got some more Animaniacs coming for third season. And uh, yeah, recently I think we finished airing all of our Cuphead as well, the Cuphead show. Um, and I think, oh, and Crapopolis, I'm working on a show uh, for Dan Harmon. Uh, for Fox uh, called Crapopolis. That's going to be another good one. I'm trying to think of what I can say. I have a lot of NDAs, so I have to think about what's been announced. <laughs> yeah, there definitely does seem to be a lot of exciting things on the horizon. And this may be like the most obvious question in the world, but if it, there were, ever was a chance to work on an upcoming Scooby-Doo project, would you kind of jump at the opportunity? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I've been working on one now, and um, I love it. 
Like now I'm, I'm in the world. I get it. I get what the characters say. I mean, I, it makes sense to me. So I feel like I um, makes it a little easier. You know, I'm not uh, starting a project from scratch because as I'm sure a lot of voice actors feel, every time I start a new project, it's the first day of school, the first day on a job. And it's kind of me having those new, uh, you know, new student jitters or kind of new worker jitters of, oh, okay, how do I do this? And kind of finding, figuring it out. But having gotten to know these characters so well, it makes it just that much easier. So I would love to, yeah, absolutely. Would love to jump on another project if I was given that opportunity. Wow, that just sounds incredible. Like, there's so much that we have to look forward to. I don't suppose there's anything at all that you can share about that, is there? About which? About uh, the, the new project? Yeah. Um, I think it was announced um, with the Mystery Pups, Scooby-Doo and the Mystery Pups. So it's kind of a younger television show. Oh, that is absolutely incredible. Like, see, yeah. I'm so much more excited for that now because I know that Roger Eshbach is working on it and he was such a talented writer. And now to hear that you're kind of on board with that as well, it's just getting us so hyped for that. And so where's oh. the best place for people watching this to keep up with, with your work? Um, I do a lot, like I said, I'm pretty active on Twitter. So um, it's at Sarah Jane Sherman. Um, I do post some clips on Instagram as well. People can find me. Um, yeah, or just check IMDb, I guess it'd be the other, to see what's, what projects we can announce and are coming down the pike. <laughs> Well, that is absolutely incredible. I'll be sure to leave all of those in the description down below. And that does conclude the questions that I had for today. Um, but thank you so, so much for coming on. It's like flown by. I don't, I can't believe where the time has gone. It's just like, oh, okay. But it is incredible. Thank you so, so much for, for coming on today. Well, thank you for having me. You guys are great. It was such a great interview. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. And of course, thank you so much to Sophie and Tori for joining because these interviews are absolutely incredible but it's such a nice collaborative experience to be able to share it all as a community so it definitely is absolutely incredible and of course people watching this can find all of sophie and tori's links in the description down below as well as our link tree for all of our whatever we're doing right now so yeah thank you so much for watching and if you do want to see more then please like comment and subscribe and we'll see you next time